So today's topic is infection control processes. Those who have the textbook, please mention the page number in the chat box. You will have standard uh, standard precautions and then you will have PPE, then you will have the transmission-based precautions. So it's two page numbers, standard precautions and transmission-based precautions. And between these two chapters, you have the entire chapter of personal protective equipments. Okay. Reading the chapter of personal protective equipment is uh, it, it, it is a self-study chapter, so you have to read it on your own, understand it, okay? Those who are joining late, please help them out with the page numbers. So, infection control processes. You have two main process, standard precautions and transmission-based precautions. So infection uh, prevention and control, they use a risk management approach to minimize. They usually use a risk management approach uh, to minimize and or to prevent the transmission of infection. So this is a two-tiered approach. The first tier is standard precaution. Second is transmission-based precaution. So when you follow this standard and then transmission-based precaution, a high level of protection to patient, healthcare workers, and even other people within the healthcare setting can be achieved, okay? The use of standard precautions is applicable uh, to and essential for many non-healthcare settings. Even at home, standard precautions has to be used for personal care, even in body art industries, tattoo industry, okay, uh, the standard precautions has to be used. So in standard precautions, it must be applied to all patients and at all times it, uh, uh, it has to be applied regardless of the diagnosis or infection. It does not matter if the patient has an infection or if the patient does not have an infection, standard precaution should be applied, okay. These are designed in such a way to reduce the risk of transmission of microorganisms from both recognized and unrecognized sources of infection. Okay, you do not know uh, what is the source of the microorganism. Okay, uh, it is yet to be found out. For example, when there is an outbreak and things are yet to be solved, things are yet to be found out. Okay, you do not know what kind of infection this outbreak is. Is it a, con a contact-based, droplet-based, airborne? You do not know yet. Okay, so that is the time when transport or standard precautions in full force, it has to be followed. When it comes to transmission-based precaution, they are, these are specific to modes of transmission. Okay, there are different modes of transmission like airborne, droplet, contact. So these are different modes of transmission. So based on these tra uh, modes of transmission, uh, transmission-based precautions will be put into use. So these are specific precautions. They require and they are required to prevent or interrupt the transmission of specific kind of pathogens. Okay, because you are using transmission-based precaution to break a specific chain of infection. Okay. So standard precautions. Here, all potential all uh, patients are considered harbor of infections and microorganisms. So you have to consider all patients as potentially infectious. Okay, and such it is a must that as you also have to assume all the blood and the body fluid or substances from the patient are potentially infectious. Okay, so assume all blood, body fluid, and tissue are put infectious. And also, all unsterile needles and sharps are also similarly contaminated. That is what you have to assume. So, standard precautions are the work practices required to achieve basic level of infection prevention and control. The use of uh, standard precautions, it aims to minimize and where uh, possible, uh, eliminate the risk of transmission of infection, particularly 
the ones that are caused by blood-borne viruses. And the standard precautions apply to all patients regardless of the diagnosis. Also, while you're handling blood, uh, in, including dried blood, okay, any uh, uh, body fluids, substances like, except for sweat, okay, if you're dealing with any body fluids, uh, regardless whether they contain visible blood or invisible blood, it does not matter. Okay, if you're dealing with the body fluids of the patient, standard precautions should be used. When you come in contact with the non-intact skin of the patient, wound, etc. Okay, uh, standard precautions are used when you are contacting the mucous membranes of the patients, it has to be used. So, uh, washing the hands before any, uh, after all patient contact or specimen contact is one step. Handle the blood of all patients as potentially infectious. Wear gloves. When you know that you're going to contact the blood or body fluid of the patient, wear gloves. Prevent natal stick injuries, sharp injuries as much as possible. Wear the protect personal protective equipment while handling blood or body fluids or where you anticipate splashing of the blood or body fluids may happen. Handle all linen soil with blood and or body secretions as potentially infectious. All the laboratory specimens are also considered as infectious. You have to wear mask for TB and any other contagious respiratory infection, uh, infection compulsorily. Correctly process the in instruments and patient care equipment, that is uh, in the role of CSSD, sterilization, disinfection, decontamination has to be done based on the nature of the instrument and where it is used on, in patient care. Maintain environmental cleanliness, manage spills, blood spills, body fluid spill as per protocol. In the infection control textbook, you have tables of this spill management. Follow proper waste disposal practices. Biomedical waste management practices should be followed. So, so summarizing the standard precautions, you have hand hygiene before and after every patient contact. Hand washing, hand rubbing can be used with alcohol-based hand rub. <coughs> there are five uh, moments of hand hygiene before touching a patient, before performing a procedure, after performing a procedure, or after being exposed to body fluids or substances, after touching a client, after touching the environment around the client. Okay. Using personal protective equipment whenever there is a risk of uh, body fluid expo exposure. Using gloves, gowns, aprons, mask, eye protection, face shields. And removing after removing the PPE also, you have to immediately do hand hygiene. Environmental Under environmental control, you have to clean and process the equipments that are shared by the patients. Before the next, uh, it, it has been used on the next patient, you have to clean and process the equipment. Follow respiratory hygiene cup etiquette for all patients who have respiratory symptoms. Use and dispose uh, the shafts safely. Use antiseptic techniques in all patient care procedures. Perform routine environmental cleaning. Handle and dispose of the waste and use clean and safely, that is biomedical waste management. Coming to transmission-based precautions, these are used along with standard precautions. It's not that you forget about standard precautions here. Along with standard precautions, transmission-based precautions are used because standard precautions alone may not be sufficient to prevent the transmission of infection. That's where trans transmission-based precautions come into play. So the patients who have these disorders are known or suspected to be infected or colonized with epidemiologically important or highly transmissible pathogens that can transmit or cause infection. So uh, standard-based precautions are not required for patients who have blood-borne viruses 
like HIV, hepatitis B, uh, hepatitis C. Okay, because in this standard precautions is enough. And the type of trans uh, transmission based precautions is applied is based upon the mode of transmission. Okay, not the type of pathogen, but the way how the pathogen is transmissible. And for diseases that have multiple routes of transmission, more than one category of transmission based precautions is applied. So these are the main routes of transmission, contact, airborne and uh, droplet. So whenever you are using a transmission based precaution, it has to be tailored to this particular mode of transmission. Infection, when you're dealing with the uh, contact-based uh, infections, contact precautions, occurs through direct contact between the source and the infection and the, uh, and the recipient or indirectly through contaminated objects. You can see here, either the person who is infected directly contacts, touches the patient who is a host, susceptible host, okay? So this is direct contact or the infected patient is not touching the host directly, but indirectly through using the same objects, cash or any, any inanimate objects, both are using. Okay, so through that also the organism can be transmitted. So the management here, you have to place the patient in the examination room. Perform hand hygiene before touching the patient and even after touching the patient and wear gloves. Use gloves and gown. Using gloves and gown is uh, enough here, PP. Clean and disinfect the examination room accordingly after the patient has left before you receive another patient. Separate bathrooms for the patients with suspected diarrhea is used. Okay. Diarrhea can also be transmitted through indirect contact. Single room is preferred to keep these patients, but in case of Indian scenario, Indian hospital scenario, you do not have enough single rooms for keeping each and every. So you in Indian scenario, you do not have enough rooms to keep each and every infectious patients. So we cohort the patients. Cohort means keeping all the patients who suffer from the same infection, they are kept in the same ward. Okay, that's what we do in India mostly. Limit the movement and transport of the patient as much as possible. This applies to all infectious patients. As much as possible, limit their movement within the hospital. Dedicated patient care equipments for single patients is given. This, these patient care equipments will not be used for any other patient. Now, next coming to uh, airborne transmission. So, it occurs by the respiratory route and the agent or infectious agent is already present in the aerosols or droplet, okay, that the infectious patient is coughing out, sneezing out, okay, that will leave some spray of aerosols. So, the infectious agent is present in this aerosols, okay. And they are very tiny in their size. That they, they are less than 5 micrometer in diameter. The pathogens. It could be a virus or a bacteria. Okay. They are so tiny in their uh, diameter that they will not fall down. Their weight is so light that they are so tiny. Their weight is so light that they will remain suspended in the air for very long time. After an infectious patient has sneezed or coughed. Okay, these tiny microbes are so lightweight that they remain in the atmosphere for a longer time. And they're so lightweight that even with normal air current, even if the fan is running in the room, okay, with the air current, they can uh, they can be transmitted from one room to another room. Okay, and, and it, they can be inhaled by other people present in the next room as well. Okay. So tuberculosis, measles, chicken pox, the herpes zoster, these are some of the airborne transmitted disorders. 
Also, COVID-19, H1N1, spine flu, okay, they also come under airborne transmission, SARS as well. Here you can see how it is. Uh, these are droplet infections. Here, uh, the size of the microbe is bigger than 5 micrometers. So, they fall down. Okay, But when the microbes are very lightweight, lesser than 5 micrometers, they can travel through air currents. With, they, can be tra uh, they can be moved to a longer distance. Okay. Management of patients with airborne transmission. You have to use respiratory protection here. N95 mask and 97 mask can be used. Gloves has to be used in both the cases. Airborne and droplet as well. Surgical mask is used. In airborne, either uh, NZS1715 uh, can be used, AS, AS mask can be used, P2 respirators can be used. Goggles and face shields also can be used. Negative pressure room uh, should be used here. Non-immune staff or pregnant staff should not be posted in the airborne transmission uh, uh, ward where the patient there is a patient of airborne transmission. Do not post pregnant staffs or non-immune staffs here. Negative pressure rooms are important here for airborne transmission, admitting airborne transmission patients. For, for every staff who are immune to varicella or rubella, means they have got chicken pox or rubella, infection in their childhood, they don't have to wear mask. Wear gloves, goggles, gowns. If you know that when you are going to care for the patient, some respiratory fluid can be sprayed onto you. So wear these things. Perform hand hygiene. Instruct the patient also to wear mask while they are exiting the examination room or they, when they are in public. Okay, or for, Teach them hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, cough etiquette, after the patient is discharged, you have to disinfect the entire examination room as well. And keep the room vacant for at least one hour before the patient, after the patient leaves. Separate entrance to the facility is given for all airborne transmission cases. Here you will require isolation room, negative pressure isolation room is required to admit an airborne transmission case. And if you don't have such rooms, do not have the facilities to manage such cases, transfer the patient. Self-closing doors should be available in the rooms where these patients are admitted. So you don't have to physically close the door. Ventilation and exhaust fan should be present because that makes the room negative pressure. Doors and windows of the room where these patients are admitted will always remain closed. And again, limit the movement and transport of the patients. So infection, next, page, uh, next is infection by droplet transmission occurs through large particle droplets that are more than 5 mu size in diameter. And these droplets are generated from the infected patients when they are they're coughing or sneezing. But it will not go to a long distance. It will be propelled only to a short distance and it will fall down naturally. So it applies to patients who have influenza uh, infection, adenovirus infection, pneumovirus infection, bordetella pertussis, mysteria meningitis, streptococcal infections. Okay, They come under droplet transmission. Then... In airborne, the same, you can see in the droplet transmission, the particles are so uh, big. It is bigger than 5 microns in diameter. They are heavy and they cannot travel a long distance. In short distance, within 6 feet, they will fall down. Okay. In less than 6 feet, they will fall down. So, when you are managing these cases, prioritize the patients with excessive cough and sputum production when you know you're standing in the reception or in the entrance. If a patient is coughing excessively, 
and a lot of sputum is produced, understand that could be a tra doctor transmission and separate them, these patients from other patients or, or from the crowd. Do wear mask, gloves, gowns and goggles. If you know, if you go near the patient, the patient can cough or sneeze and some spraying of respiratory fluid is anticipated and hygiene should be done. Also teach the patients to wear mask while exiting the examination room or whenever they are in public. Clean and disinfect the examination room. Single room is preferred here. Wear mask when working within three feet of the patient is anticipated. Pacing between the beds, one or two meters should be kept. Limit the patient movement and transport. Dedicated use of patient care equipment to a single patient. Again, don't change the equipments. Don't uh, use the uh, equipment used for these patients for any other general patient care. So that's about the infection uh, control processes.